Hey, good morning, everyone. I am Joe Rizzo with the Loudon Museum, and this is the next interview in our series for Pour Over History. And this morning, I am joined by Dr. Lauren Thompson, who is an assistant professor at McKendree University. And what we're talking about for this interview today is her upcoming book. It's called Friendly Enemies, Soldier Fraternization Throughout the American Civil War. Uh, it's by University of Nebraska Press, and it'll be available in August 2020. Uh, so Lauren, thanks for joining me. Uh, I know we have an upcoming museum talk planned about your book, but I think this might be a good way to introduce your book, your topic, uh, as a lead up to when you can actually come to the museum and uh, give us a talk about it. And Sounds how are good. you doing in St. Louis right now? How's, how's everything going with you? It's going pretty well. Um, living in St. Louis is um, certainly fun, but challenging during these times since we don't have Cardinals baseball. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's pretty good other than my students um, who are taking online school right now, but they should be graduating in two weeks regardless. And thanks for having me here on the talk. Of course, at least we have the NFL draft to look forward to. And as yes, that starts this weekend. So my Steelers um, don't have a first round pick. So, <laughs> and I think bills. <laughs> I know the Bills have like three. So we're good to go. <laughs> awesome. Well, let's get right into it. Uh, again, I want to talk mostly about your upcoming book and some of the research and interesting aspects that you found while doing that research. Uh, and of course, you work for the National Park Service uh, at Civil War Battlefields in Virginia. And I was wondering if you got this idea for what eventually became this book about soldier fraternization from working for the Park Service, and if there was one particular story that kind of led down the road to this project. That's a great question. And um, yes, this topic did develop when I was working at Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park. So I was actually doing a master's thesis with you at West Virginia. And when I was working at the battlefields over the summer, there was an exhibit in Chancellorsville Battlefield, actually, that was called Friendly Enemies. And so it's no longer there anymore with the redesign, but it's actually where I got the topic for my book. Because when you walk by it, it kind of catches your eye as an oxymoron, like what? And when you learn about the uh, trade of coffee and tobacco across the Rappahannock River after the Battle of Fredericksburg before Chancellorsville, it's kind of this tale of this happening. Um, Mark Kutzler has a famous painting about it. Um, actually, even in the Hollywood film Gods and Generals, there's a scene where they trade coffee and tobacco on the river. And so it's kind of this like fiction, you know, it's this kind of romanticized um, image of this battlefield and with the help of my master's thesis advisor Pete Carmichael at the time we decided that this would be an interesting um, topic to pursue because you hear about it all the time but was there actually weight to the soldiers and their letters and diaries explaining this was actually happening on a day-to-day -day basis and I would say that all of the interactions that I found during this time were exciting to pursue, right? Because Fredericksburg is not one of those battles that after or, be, you know, before on February, I'm sorry, on December 11th and 12th, um, the Union Army kind of ransacked the town and that was ran deep within the Southern soldiers. Um, and then also after the battle, when Southerners kind of took the coats um, and clothing off dead or dead and wounded Union soldiers, there was a lot of hatred um, in this battle. And it was obviously very lopsided in the Southern, Southerners' favor. Um, but to realize this bloody battle that happens in the winter, um, and then all of a sudden, like for five months, these guys come together and trade coffee and tobacco, like nothing happened. And so all of these interactions seem very strange, right? And then I think reading them all of all of them that happened during that winter i think my favorite ones are when you hear that where the river was deeper and union and confederate guys couldn't cross over it themselves they would construct toy boats and so union men um, across the river would send coffee um, little bags of coffee over and then the southerners would 
put tobacco on the boats and like push them back over. Um, and so you see these grown men who just went through this horrific battle about to have another spring campaign and they're, you know, jovial and building these little boats to get these commodities. And so on the river at that time, I think that was kind of my favorite story, but that's only, I guess, where this project has just begun. Yeah, and you bring up a good point. I always like to make that people get consumed with battles when they look at the Civil War. But these are anomalies in the four years of warfare that the vast majority of soldiers' time is not fighting. Yeah. Uh, but that's just kind of the easiest way for us to compartmentalize and to clump kind of various aspects and campaigns of the war. But for the soldiers living them, it's probably the camp life and interactions and uh, human contact that is very much defining how they think of the war. And for a lot of these soldiers, who are in close proximity with the enemy, like you look at, and like we get it with Virginia, uh, up here in Loudoun, we have that with the Potomac River, but of course, uh, when you were looking at Fredericksburg with the Rappahannock. And these are obviously people who are fighting each other, but again, that's not every day. Uh, so how did you see soldiers write about their interactions with the enemies? Okay, so this is really intriguing because um, I would say overall for my uh, doctoral dissertation and then for my book, um, I've read about, I'd say anywhere between 500 and 600 soldiers' letters and diaries, both Union, Union and Confederate. And so when you really get into soldiers' diaries, you see what, or uh, letters home, you see what they like to tell their family, okay? And then you see what they avoid. And so one of the things that soldiers like to tell their family is how good of a job they're doing. Um, so in order to do that, like you said, they always don't have a lot to talk about. So what they'll bring up is all the bad things other soldiers are doing, right? So they'll say, you know, there was a court martial today for soldiers who were deserting or so-and-so was drinking and he punched our officer. I would never do something like that. Um, so they like to bring about like how other men are kind of not doing their duty, but but they are, right? And they do this with female and male family members. Now, fraternization is kind of the opposite, and it kind of leads to show that even though fraternization was against orders, um, it's more palatable and tolerable because men are writing about it home, and they're saying, I did this, right? Like, men are not going to write home, like, I deserted, or I was drunk, or um, I am brought up on charges for disorderly conduct. You rarely find that. You see them talking about others doing that. Whereas with fraternization, they're openly saying that they disobeyed orders. They're openly saying that they did something that was a, a form of resistance, but they're very proud to say that, hey, when I was on the river yesterday during picket duty, I shouted across the river, hey, Yank, um, got any coffee? And they say it almost as like business as usual. And so it becomes kind of normalized behavior, but then it also is something that they're proud of and not afraid to show in their letters and diaries, which worked for me because I could read about it all the time. It also kind of shows that it's something that was not carrying a stigma, like other forms of desertion, like coward or like cowardly behavior or things that are, I guess, not falling in line with someone's service and their duty. And fraternization kind of is this intermediary form of resistance that soldiers aren't afraid to talk about. And so I think that's kind of in, in some, the other thing too is they will maybe not participate in it, but they'll witness it, but they won't criticize their comrades who witness it. They'll say like on the lines today, you know, we were able to meet in a ravine and trade uh, newspapers at Petersburg. And they say it as if they were part of that exchange. They weren't, I guess, criticizing their comrades who did. So it's kind of the really special thing about fraternization and it's what the book tries to highlight. Yeah, it sounds like almost it's an emotional transaction too, not just you know, mm -hmm. particular goods. That they needed this, you know, on both sides equally, where they're both going through shared hardships potentially, and maybe that's a common bond they find. Uh, so, like when they're trading back and forth, what kind of items are they looking for, and you know, what are the popular things written about? Yeah, so aside from coffee and tobacco, some of the things that they will trade are um, food, especially during a siege. Um, when we look at Vicksburg and then um, 
after the Battle of Chickamauga before Chattanooga and then at Atlanta and then um, at Petersburg, we see different armies, but when different armies um, are together for long periods of time, um, they will be able to, I guess, personalize their experience and identify and no longer becomes the enemy. It'll be the 16th Mississippi in front of them, right? So they recognize their flag, they recognize their um, daily routine. And so what they'll do is begin to kind of trade food. Um, not only will they trade food, but one of the things that is so important um, in these transactions is the trade of newspapers. Um, and now we think, well, they're reading their own newspapers, like what's so important about an enemy's newspaper? But we have to remember these guys who are in the ranks, they know very little about larger campaigns outside of their own, about their own campaign and commanders and strategies, and then also the political background, things like the Emancipation Proclamation, the election of 1864, prisoner exchanges. There's a lot of things going on in the world that they don't know about. And so when we don't know about things, it resorts to the rumor mill. And because camp rumors are really all they can rely on, as we know in the workplace, rumors can lead to fabrications and anxieties. So we like to know. And when men see their enemies' papers as something they could obtain through exchanges, it's basically like how the other side is interpreting their sacrifices, right? Their sacrifices, what they're doing on the battlefield. And so enemy papers become something um, that is not only exchanged quite frequently, but I looked at court martial records for men who were brought up under order, orders number 57, which is disobedience of orders. And so of all of the court martials, union, union only, just union records, of all the court martials, um, we see about half of them were over the exchange of newspapers. And so this is something that a lot of people, particularly in the high command, wanted to cut back on um, because not only are they exchanging newspapers, they're exchanging secrets <laughs> and they're exchanging strategy. And so the high command wanted to keep the men in the ranks kind of not in the know so that they could continue to maneuver these men where they needed to be without creating skepticism or other forms of dissent. So the exchanges of newspapers was, I have a whole chapter in the book because information is critical for these guys. Um, another thing that's exchanged, which is interesting, is um, trinkets and souvenirs. Um, they will trade buttons, hats, pocket knives, um, belt buckles, little things that they can give back and forth. And when we think of souvenirs, we think of like something to, it doesn't really have any tangible benefit at the time, like coffee, tobacco, or information or food, but we get souvenirs to remember something, right? And it's kind of a, a token of that moment. And so the fact that they trade these and then they bring them back to their camp and hide them during inspection, it's interesting because they want to kind of commemorate a moment where they had a choice um, and they had power over, I guess, their environment to have this exchange. And sometimes people will even, sometimes some of these guys will even mail these trinkets home. Um, not only will they mail trinkets home to their family members, but they'll also mail letters home for the enemy. So another thing we'll see is that um, because men have family on both sides, they'll ask the enemy to mail something home to a family member on that side. And men always do because they too understand the importance of family. It's why they're there, right? And so the constant communication with the home front, um, soldiers who are fighting against one another one minute will let their guard down and appreciate kind of the mutual sacrifice of their enemy and do this favor for them and then pick up the rifle and fight again. So men are really able to kind of compartmentalize and switch back and forth quite quickly between fighting and fraternizing. And it's kind of this human, this humanization that these men are no longer the enemy, but they too are sharing similar sacrifices and hardships along yeah. with them. And in one hand, people point as the war being brother versus brother and families torn apart, like your example just gave. At the other hand, then I remember you know, especially like first Manassas when I would talk to visitors on the park service there. I mean, you got guys from Mississippi who've never left their county and now they're, mm -hmm. you know, a hundred yards away from people from Rhode Island. So it's also probably, 
kind of a fascination for them too, that they're experiencing different types of people from locations that they've never probably had any sort of interaction with. So it seems like it's an interesting blend between close knit ties, but then also kind of two different worlds simultaneously. Oh yeah. And they're definitely bored. They're curious. And we have to remember, just like you said, all these men have ever heard about a Yankee or a Reb is the propaganda that got them in this position in the first place. So the pre-war propaganda that um, led up to the election of 1860 and through the volatile 1850s is all they really heard, right? And then they get across from these guys and they're like, they're not really that different from me. And so we begin to see these barriers break down, especially when we have, um, you know, a smoke or a cup of coffee or a drink, it kind of greases the wheels of sociability, right? We do it with business transactions. We do it um, in different kind of spaces where we're trying to get to know somebody or kind of break down barriers. Barriers. And so when you combine that in these spaces, um, we see that we see that empathy begin to develop between um, men on different sides. Yeah. And to that point, I'm, I'm curious. I don't even know what I would even think as a guess has how this changes and maybe doesn't change as the war progresses. Because on one end, you might think that as more killing goes on and they get sick of war, that they would grow bitterness towards the enemy. At the same time, maybe they're becoming desensitized to that bitterness. Like they might initially have at the war and it wears off and they're just like seeing themselves more as trained soldiers doing a job. Did you see much change between say early 1862 and to the, maybe the final months of the war? Absolutely. And um, even though we've talked a lot about armies in the East today, starting with Fredericksburg, when I went in to expand this project into a dissertation, I had no idea what I was going to find. And I found fr cases of fraternization as early as July 1861 at Manassas. And the last case I have is April 5th in Richmond, um, 1865, right? So it spans the whole war, um, but it also spans different theaters. And so the um, Western theater and armies who are operating um, outside of Virginia, they're actually Grant's Army of the Tennessee and then the Department of Mississippi at Vicksburg. Um, we're gonna see it then, and we're gonna see it continue throughout um, Tennessee and Georgia is when you're in a siege, it's a different set of circumstances, right? When the men were fraternizing on, front, on the Rappahannock, they had orders not to communicate, right? Or not to fire, right? So they were not supposed to fire. It was kind of this peaceful, they're on picket duty. Um, but when you're in a siege, you're supposed to constantly keep up your fire, right? And you can't rest, you can't sleep, you can't eat, you can't let your guard down. And so what we begin to see starting at Vicksburg and then we're going to see it all throughout the rest of the war is we are going to see soldiers negotiate ceasefires with one another and so when they are in the trenches and they have orders to fire men on one side or the other will say hey let's not fire anymore and if our commander comes down or a new unit comes out we'll fire two warning shots to let you know that the armistice is over. And so they would do this constantly, um, working with the enemy in order to prevent kind of useless bloodshed, right? Because these are hardened veterans um, and they've kind of seen combat, they've seen bloodshed. And the last thing they want to do is see their friends stand up to go get some water and be shot in the head, right? And so they realize we can work with the enemy to limit bloodshed. And not only are these um, I guess, arrangements or these ceasefires that they negotiate constantly happening. But I've, ha I've seen instances where men will say somebody on their side will try to break it and they'll threaten him and say, no, you can't break this. Like, this is what we've worked out. Like, and so they'll take the side of their enemy over their own comrades in order to keep the peace. And so not only do we see these ceasefires happen, but we see swimming parties, specifically in the Chattahoochee River after Kennesaw Mountain. Um, Sherman's men and Joe Johnson's men will have the ceasefire. And then these like guys will just jump in the river and swim and have this, you know, kind of jovial time um, before going to Atlanta and bringing, you know, this siege and then this, the fall of Atlanta a few months later. And so we see it as, you know, young men being young men and just wanting to relax and um, have a break from the constant 
danger and the fear and anxiety that comes with it. And so they definitely changed throughout the war. Um, and then also you have the factor later in the war that men begin to have more respect for their enemy because their enemy is there. And they have hatred for people who stay home and criticize their efforts, specifically um, peace Democrats, right? Or politicians in the North who've had their, paid their exemptions, you know, pay their substitutes. And they're sitting there criticizing their sacrifice and also going to vote for McClellan, who's going to ensure that their sacrifice was for nothing. Um, so a lot of times men will say like, you know, my enemy, uh, you know, I'm fighting against him, but he um, pales in comparison to the copperheads back home. And so we begin to see men being able to empathize enough to save their own lives and survive and preserve, but also to see that um, the, in many ways it is a rich man's war with a poor man's fight and let the men who brought on this war come down and try this rather than criticize us. Yeah, and plenty of examples of both where it turns into potentially uh, class warfare in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's a lot of resentment through ways in which you can avoid the draft in the Confederacy, uh, especially early on in the war. And yeah, with um, peace movements in both sides, both Southern states and Northern states, trying to end the war. So if there's one thing that surprised you during the research, you know, is there a particular story or aspect of the research that sticks out the most? Yes. Um, so obviously, as I kind of mentioned, being able to find fraternization throughout the entire war, right? It kind of dots anytime men come together, we see it. So it's not like, oh, it's just veteran soldiers or, oh, it's just Midwestern guys, right? It's kind of happening all the time. And the one kind of thread that pulls through is when armies are together for long periods of time, we see it happen the most. And that's kind of what my book focuses on. However, there is something that surprised me, and that was when at Petersburg, we know there is a large presence of uh, men of color in uniform with the USCTs fighting in segregated units, but next to white Union soldier units. And some of the Union guys will write um, that they went out and exchanged with Confederates to exchange newspapers or have ceasefires. And then in the same letter, they denounce and say very kind of racially um, inappropriate things about their comrades in blue, um, their men of color, the USCTs. And so seeing that men are, I guess, in solidarity with their enemy over men of color who are on their side, um, I was really surprised by that because I thought, you know, we're fighting the same war, we're on the same side, and it's not just like the Irish soldier who <laughs> voted Democrat before the war, it's, it's coming more frequently than I expected. And so that was kind of a sad thing. It kind of took me back to see like, you know, if, if these men are fighting for the same thing as you and your, you know, brother in arms, you're choosing your enemy of these men. Um, and unfortunately, because we see men come together across sectional and um, sectional lines, we see them kind of choose reunion and reconciliation over um, racial harmony and emancipation and the promises of reconstruction. And so what I say in my book is that um, these interactions during the war are kind of um, not only do they uphold white male solidarity, but they're kind of the litmus test for the post-war world. When we have men of color um, kind of vying for, for spaces, we see them left out, um, regardless of whether these men fought, um, these white men fought for slavery and uh, whether keeping it or eliminating it, um, we see them ignore these ideas and not talk about causes of the war, not talk about consequences and unite over their shared sufferings, um, leaving the term race out of it. And then people of color, um, it's at their expense in the post-war. And so that was very interesting to find. And then I analyze it a lot in my last chapter, um, Civil War Memory, because um, I think that was like my biggest surprise. And maybe I was just a little bit naive um, when I first started looking at that, but then I was really able to connect it to the post-war um, society and see that, you know, it was kind of obvious this would happen, but it was a, a surprise and frustrating at first. Yeah, I can imagine, you know, we look at so much issues of race, obviously before the war and war causation and during it, and of course, it doesn't end in 1865. And this is probably a great example to show how deeply kind of racist feelings in the North 
very much mm -hmm. just like the South, that it's not a North or South kind of thing, that uh, the sentiment runs in the North and it continues so in uh, memorials and remembrances for years after the war. And in some probably ways gets even worse. Yeah, especially with after the war, we see a lot of um, soldiers um, writing about their interactions of fraternization. And we see a lot of politicians be like, oh, this is great. Let's use your testimony, because if we got along during the war, we can certainly get along now. Um, except for when they do that, it becomes fabricated, embellished, quite romanticized. And so a lot of historians think that fraternization was actually a post-war construction for reunionists and reconciliationists um, because we see the veterans like shaking hands over the bloody chasm at the reunions and it kind of becomes that culture but what my project shows is that long before these men became grizzly gray veterans they were doing this um, during the war and of course when they did it during the war it wasn't to promote some sort of post war racial tone it was out of survival it was out of practicality and it was about a, a, a way to control their environment um, to survive another day um, but then these mo these moments really become a lot um, after the war and so their story will continue um, whether they have control of that story and that narrative or not Awesome. Well, thank you, Lauren, for joining us for this Pour Over History uh, interview. Again, her book that's coming out in August 2020 is Friendly Enemy, Enemies, Soldier Fraternization Throughout the American Civil War. And we look forward to having you give a book talk at the museum once we're open and the book is out. And yes. we plan on doing this every week. Again, this Pour Over History series. And of course, with the museum, uh, we've got a blog that we post every Friday and History on Tap programs uh, live streamed every Thursday. Uh, so again, Lauren, stay safe and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks for having me.